Hello. Good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Raul, uh, Raul Tavares, and I'm coming from Canalia, then Spain. Uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, we have a very interesting event, I think, but at the same time, a very packed agenda. So we are going to be really strict on time. And, and we will have two, two, two keynote speakers today. Um, well, this is not working. That's <laughs> Uh, well, no, it's not working. Well, yeah. <laughs> so we have two keynote speakers, uh, one from the OCD, one from the European Commission, and a round table with uh, two independent experts and two representatives of two different regions in, in the north and the south of, of, of Europe. So I will go directly to introduce my uh, our first speaker, who is Katerina. Uh, she works as, as a public policy analyst at the OCD Local Employment and Economic Development Center in Trento. His background is in human and social capital in territorial development policies from Santana School of, of Advanced Studies in Pisa. And she has also worked with the European Commission and ATD. Um, uh, her title of the speech is Closing the Circle, Smart Specialization, Local Development, and Sustainability. I think that uh, it will be a very nice uh, speech, and, well, and that's it. So enjoy the day. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Thanks, many thanks to the organizer for uh, for inviting me to Brussels, and it is actually a great pleasure to be here in person uh, after the COVID and after many many uh, online events to see how you work in groups. And I'm very much looking forward to learning from you uh, after this event on what you actually did on the ground in terms of. Uh, using smart specialization framework in line with uh, responsible research uh, innovation. So the topic of uh, my speech today is uh, looking at how we can uh, or how smart specialization concept and framework uh, is aligned with uh, the uh, the uh, the ground missions and and uh, objectives of, uh, of uh, sustainable development and uh, social goals. So briefly about uh, the content, uh, I will look at the evolution of smart specialization, where we come from and uh, what are the possible pathways for uh, the future development of smart specialization as a concept, but also, uh, also the framework and uh, how we can uh, address sustainability uh, issues and social challenges using a smart specialization on the ground. And then I will refer to two publications that uh, I published when I was working for the European Commission Joint Research Center with uh, other uh, experts like uh, uh, Michal Michinski, where we were analyzing the literature and uh, the academic discourse on uh, mission-oriented uh, research and research uh, responsible research innovation in line with smart specialization. So place-based uh, transformative agendas of smart specialization and grant the, uh, the discourse on sustainable development goals and the grant emissions that are top-down approach and some final considerations in the end. Uh, I worked for the European Commission in uh, Seville until 2021. 20, uh, and then uh, this year I joined the OECD Center in uh, Trento. Uh, I focus very much on research and policy advice uh, focuses very much on local development and the pathways. And uh, in Trento, we uh, work also on uh, skills and transition, like uh, the transitions from um, and helping to, uh, to define or uh, to analyze the, the transition pathways for uh, skills and uh, future jobs. Uh, we also work on entrepreneurship and SMEs linked to, uh, link to economic growth, local economic growth, 
competitive and resilient places, and finally, culture, tourism, and global events, and the impact, uh, positive and also challenges in terms of uh, local development. Just I brought one specific example uh, of a very specific project on teleworking because it uh, was the topic during the COVID, but it remains the topic because uh, the, uh, there are emerging policies on how to implement teleworking, uh, not only policies, but practices. And we are analyzing what advantages uh, exist for, uh, for the regions and local places and territories and the conclusion is that if the policies are well defined and implemented, that uh, then teleworking can contribute to uh, zero emission targets, uh, production, uh, well being. So there are many advantages. So this is one specific example how we work and the intersection between local development and, uh, and skills and, and, and forming. So going to the core of uh, of uh, the uh, this uh, this uh, event and uh, follow up workshop and uh, group discussions. So the topic that I'm going to discuss is based on the research, rigorous research that we conducted uh, at Joint Research Center, and I would refer specifically to the first uh, report that is about addressing sustainability challenges and sustainable development goals via smart uh, specialization. So just a few words about the concept. Uh, it was launched at the end of 2000. It was, it was discussed uh, from the perspective of research innovation at uh, RTD, and then it was adopted by uh, DG Regio as a main policy uh, concept or approach for the European Regional Development Funds. That was a policy side, but on the side of uh, academic research, many academics discuss what is this concept about and what are the advantages or disadvantages and what it can bring in terms of cohesion in Europe. So uh, the father, we can say the father of smart specialization, uh, Dominic Forer says, it is a new industrial policy that can bring positive structural change. So this is about industrial uh, policy. The same uh, about, uh, about smart specialization said uh, Radosevic, he said it is industrial and innovation policy experiment. But Kevin Morgan went a little bit further and he said it's not only about research innovation, it is not only about industrial policy and revisiting uh, the industrial policy from the perspective of economic growth. It is also about changing the routines. Uh, 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 sorry. It is about the innovation policy, but also about the institutions and development. So the smart specialization should have brought development, local development to the territories and the good governance of research innovation. Uh, in my latest paper, uh, I, uh, when I analyzed specifically the impact of smart specialization, not from economics, so not uh, indicators on employment, economic growth, but mostly on, uh, on what smart specialization have changed in Central Eastern Europe, in terms of uh, quadrupedalic collaboration, I uh, fa I found uh, that it brought a lot of interaction among uh, the stakeholders, and it brought a new governance structures. So the interaction that were really scattered in uh, Central Eastern Europe became more institutionalized. So here it was already towards the end of the last economic period. This this uh, change in terms of governance and institutions. But there are also critics of smart specialization saying that it focused extremely on and purely on research, uh, research linked to technology development and technology deployment, leaving aside social innovation. So leaving aside all the aspects that are linked to uh, well-being, uh, social uh, innovation, uh, social services, uh, societal uh, needs, uh, sustainability, although it was mentioned in the guide about sustainability aspects, but it was never really taken into consideration when the, uh, the public administration were, were developing smart specialization because that was very much focused on really bringing the economic growth and uh, eventually uh, new jobs. Uh, and also weak measurement system and practices. That was very weak because uh, monitoring and evaluation was mentioned, 
but it was not really uh, developed in terms of methodology. So every region did it how they were able to do it. And sometimes uh, it didn't inform the new generation of small specialization. So there was very much focus on the first uh, part, so the uh, development of the strategy, but very little on implementation, monitoring, and evaluation that uh, hopefully will uh, change uh, in the current programming uh, in the year. So just to summarize, we come from region at the core. So it was very much about endogenous development, looking at the local knowledge, capacities, institutions, and actors that were located in the territory. Very little about outward looking dimensions, considering what other regions were, uh, the strengths of other regions and how one region could collaborate with the other region. Although we uh, at the GRC were attempting to launch uh, thematic platforms, so there was uh, ongoing work during the implementation phase. And very much looking at the bottom up approach. So uh, the smart specialization relied on engagement and input from the innovators and stakeholders. After the, uh, the first analytical work done by public administration, the, it was the entrepreneurial discovery process that was uh, uh, that was at the core of definition of the priorities. So the priorities had to be decided by entrepreneurs by all the actors sitting around the table and uh, it, it was com it was bottom up what was suggested at the end of the last programming period was that there are big mega trends big challenges that local stakeholders often are not aware of and do not take into consideration when they are discussing the priorities and they there should be alignment between these both uh, top top down priorities for example, um, the, the sustainable, uh, sustainable Development Goals of the UN uh, Agenda, but also uh, the, uh, the missions defined by RTD, but also at the national level or subnational level. The missions do not exist at subnational level. They exist at the national level and supranational level. But this alignment was missing in the past, and the, we we are trying to somehow inform and, and try to wait, try to find a way how we can combine this bottom up and, and top down uh, approaches. Quickly on some challenges, uh, and this is linked to the work of the OECD. One of the challenges is uh, democratic change and uh, the population of rural areas, for example. <laughs> Just think about uh, regions where small specialization, uh, where the regions that are rural areas, and they are, look, uh, they are uh, witnessing uh, young people leaving these territories and going to big cities. This will have a big impact on, uh, for example, uh, services associated with aging, and for example, health services, healthcare services, uh, and uh, social services, and there needs to be uh, innovation. Not in not in all regions that we that are affected by uh, by uh, demographic change. This was somehow considered in this mass specialization. Another is, for example, linked to European Green Deal and Green Transition. This map shows the employment shares of the mass uh, the most gas intensive manufacturing sectors and you can see uh, that the largest share is uh, uh, Sweden and then Central Eastern Europe. We have also another map looking at the regions that can be called vulnerable regions where the share of uh, population and uh, employees in polluting industries and also pollution per capita is the highest, and it is again the Central Europe. This means that these regions will suffer uh, more than the others of the in, of uh, the green transition, uh, and this needs to be consideration uh, considered in a smart specialization as well. And how to do it? Because we have this data, and this is really top down approach. We know it's top down, but the regional authorities need to consider it when they are discussing bottom up priorities or smart facilitation. Key, key questions, I will not go into all, all of them, but just let me uh, let me mention the first two. 
these are the questions that we uh, ask when we were when we were discussing uh, really how smart specialization can help in addressing uh, challenges that are uh, social challenges and sustainability challenges. So how we can uh, adapt and transform the whole framework to include the all discussions linked to not only economic, but also social and environmental issues and dimensions of sustainability and development goals. And what are the policies and governance implications that will or will be connected to the uh, embedding uh, directionality towards the sustainability. So the, the governance also and the policies will have to change because they have to somehow embrace this, this uh, dual, uh, dual logic. I have already talked about uh, mission-oriented policy approaches. This table comes from the first publication that I mentioned where we are looking at uh, mission-oriented uh, assumptions or the, the logic where we have assumption, rational scale and legitimacy and looking at subnational and supranational. What are the advantages and disadvantages? And definitely there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the grand challenges or social challenges cannot be addressed only with top-down uh, uh, policy uh, uh, policy instruments and, uh, and actions, they need to be really, really subnational, subnational actions. So subnational means to translate the big goals into its own strategies and poli uh, policies, and they need to be context specific solutions. This goes back to the, uh, to, to the map that I showed, the figure that I showed before, because every region is facing different challenges. Uh, Central Eastern Europe very much linked to the transition to green uh, industries. Others are uh, linked to, for example, social challenges, so aging population that is more significant, for example, in the Southern Europe uh, regions. Hore already said something about mission-oriented innovation policy. He said that the mass specialization framework is actually adaptable and it is very flexible framework and we can work with it. It is not a framework that was uh, only thought to bring economic recovery after the uh, financial crisis, but it can be taken as a concept and framework and adapted to really bring this uh, top-down and bottom-up uh, approach. Only one thing is this experimental nature because missions are really about experimentations. In smart specialization, it's the, the, we need to bring this discussion about experiment, experimentation because, and we can bring it in practical terms into the calls, uh, into the definition of selection criteria in the calls, and really bring it on the ground to experiment what can work and uh, what. Now, to the specifically about a responsible uh, research innovation that is topic of your project. Uh, we have a small chapter in the publication when uh, there is very little literature, almost the literature doesn't exist on responsible research innovation because it is concept that is horizontal, it's transversal. It doesn't have the place-based place -based aspects. It doesn't go into the territories looking at this very specific uh, uh, issues of the territories. It is really looking at how we can uh, conduct uh, or frame the research that is responsible towards the society uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for example, the environment. So there is also a window uh, open to how to bring these two concept, uh, concepts together. And I know that we will be discussing uh, this uh, after uh, our presentations, and uh, we discuss it from the uh, really theoretical and conceptual point of view. But you can bring into the real, really, really practical examples how this can be done uh, on the ground, and other regions will be very willing to learn from your experience. So for final considerations, we can say that in order to have smart specialization uh, work in line and contribute to the delivery or uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to achievement 
of the sustainable goals and sustainability as it is defined in many EU documents and uh, EU Green Deal, it needs to be revisited and extended to foster transformative system innovation. So first, it's about introducing a strong direc direc uh, directionality and intention. So it is not only about collecting priorities from, from uh, the stakeholders, but really open the discussion on what is the direction or what is the final objective, what we want to improve in uh, the territory. Then allow for the bottom up experimentation and diverse pathways for different types of innovation. So not only research innovation, but broader. Foster a whole system transformation towards sustainability. So really included the, all the discussion about sustainability into the, into the, uh, into the framework institutions and the governance of smart facilitation, leave no place behind. Here it means uh, not only for the most developed and regions that have strong institutional capacities, but also encourage those that have maybe weaker institutional capacities to work with this, because already smart specialization framework was difficult uh, to somehow you know, to embed or to, to, to translate it to local uh, needs of regions that were not really institutionally strong, but here uh, we should work uh, on, uh, on this as well. And finally, boost inter-regional policy learning because we cannot have different, it's, it's difficult to <clears throat> work separately because the, we can learn from each other, not to copy, but we can definitely learn. And uh, it's great to see you all here in this room, but also I know people online, uh, that you will actually learn from each other and maybe your experience will um, will uh, motivate and uh, bring also change in, uh, in other regions. So thank you very much for your attention and this is my uh, this is my email and please feel free to contact me with whatever question or uh, interest you have. Many thanks. Many thanks, Katerina. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. I know that there is not uh, too much time, but we will have the uh, opportunity to make uh, some questions. Uh, for those also that you are in a virtual space, um, just anyone? There are no questions in the chat window. No chat, no questions in the chat window. Lisa? Yeah. Thank you. And you're hearing me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you, Richard, Noe, and Eurota for organizing organizing today and tomorrow. And thank you for a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Um, I actually have a question about the future of RI and how you view it, and about um, it merging into the horizontal principle. How do you see that um, the concept of RI? will change or merge into sustainability and, and the horizontal principles in the future. Thank you. I'm a, I must say that I'm not expert on responsible decision innovation. I'm more expert on the side of smart specialization and local development uh, strategies. So um, I cannot comment on how responsible research innovation will change the whole discussion, for example, of uh, RTD policies, because uh, I know that it is concept pushed by uh, DGRPD. Uh, what we tried in the, in the publication is to see, to look at existing literature on different approaches linked to research innovation and how they actually mention this um, place-based approaches, how they really go into the uh, territories. Uh, so I'm afraid I cannot give you an answer to this. Uh, I can only say that there was only one publication on uh, smart specialization and uh, responsible research innovation, and it says that it can uh, inform and uh, improve the, the whole discussion of smart specialization because it really brings and uh, the, the, the responsibility towards the territory. It's not only about uh, the local stakeholders uh, getting funding <laughs> to uh, to uh, for their and research innovation activities, it is really giving back or uh, to, to contribute to, to the local development. So 
from that perspective, I think there is opportunities, and uh, and I think we should we should uh, work in that. Thank you so much. And anyhow, I, I'm not sure whether there is a question that anyone will say the answer to, but um, thank you. That that was all really really great. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, the Thanks, Marina, for all the information. What I'd like to ask is how the PRI element in this, let's say, uh, near future or next, not even near, but next, next future. Um, <clears throat> how does it fit in what you are presenting now? Can you just develop on the, on the abbreviation? The, <clears throat> The BRI um, element, so to say, how does it fit in what you have been commenting about but, this test? I lost presentation. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. So Your partnership for oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I thought it was that. Okay, I was. So I thought it was linked to responsibility. Okay. So I think there will be a specific uh, presentation of twenty minutes, and partnerships for uh, um, exactly. It builds on the experience of smart facilitation to bring it actually to a, 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 a other level. But I will leave it to them because uh, I actually left commission before the whole uh, the, the, the action was launched, and uh, I must say I'm not in the position to comment uh, to comment on this. But I will leave it to Hannah. She's here for the reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were there's so many abbreviations that sometimes. <laughs> We, we have one more question from Nicolas. Um, yes, very brief. Mm -hmm. so, thanks. Um, that was really interesting. I wanted to ask uh, if you could comment a little bit more on what role do you see for public participation within smart specialization strategies? And in particular, um, where do you see uh, challenges between the uh, sort of general normative desire? To increase public participation and the obstacles that this may be, may sometimes create to um, various forms of, of, of transitional transformation. Thanks. That is actually a very good question. Many thanks for this question. Uh, and also difficult one. Because talking from the practice, when smart specialization was launched in many regions, with weak innovation ecosystems, it was difficult to bring entrepreneurs, really companies around the table. So it was not, we could not even open the box of the quadruple helix, the non-government non organization. And then you have the, the, the fifth part that is civil society. So, uh, you know, that, that was somehow <laughs> there in the discourse, but not in the practice. Some regions, for example, in Sweden, they did involve a non-governmental organization, but this is not a public. It's the non-governmental organizations represent the interest of specific groups. So it is uh, associations, uh, cooperatives, non-governmental. So these are, they have some legal entity. Talking about general uh, public, what was done, uh, but here is the problem. The general public was not involved in the discussion on the preparation of smart specialization, but in the discussion of the uh, strategy that was already drafted. Some regions pub, uh, published the strategies on the web pages and asked the general public on their uh, comments, something like consultation. So that is already, we can say, the first step because you can uh, draw some, uh, some, uh, some conclusions from or some, uh, some ideas. But the question mark here is how these inputs inform uh, the, the smart specialization. So there I cannot not tell, but I know that some uh, governments uh, are thinking of launching uh, the platforms mm -hmm. under different titles like innovation platforms and smart specialization platforms where they want to actually uh, discuss with the general public the priorities before the smart specialization is drafted. Here, the main, main obstacle is not to involve the public because you have the tools. I mean, like, it's, it's easy with technologies. The problem here is timing because governments have very limited time to submit the smart position strategies 
to the Commission, and they have to really, in order to to uh, to um, launch the consultation on something and then redefine and rediscuss and you know really do it like like it should be done it takes time and sometimes uh, governments they do not have the time and uh, we saw it definitely with the second generation of smart specialization because they were really they, the smart specialization was there the, the previous one they sometimes took monitoring and evaluation and redefine it then they discuss it in the year and from discovery process, but the, there is very little evidence on what was done or if the general public was consulted. And sometimes I have the impression if if it's not uh, somehow written in the regulation, it's not. <laughs> so this is my my just private opinion on this. It would definitely benefit all the strategic benefit of the input from general public. Thanks. Thank you very much, Katarina. So I, I want to introduce now our second uh, keynote speaker. She's Hannah Schmidberger. I hope I have pronounced it properly. So she's a social psychologist. And she has a background in European administration. And she currently works uh, as policy officer at uh, the Commission's uh, Gender Research uh, Center. So she probably answers to uh, the questions related to the um, partnership for regional innovation because she's working on the implementation of these pilot actions, but she has a very uh, particular focus on uh, regulations and uh, co-creation uh, methodology. So I think it's very important also for this um, project now to have this kind of information on, on how we can um, co-create uh, better. Okay. So yeah, hello everyone, and thank you very much to the organizers for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to present you PRI, Partnerships for Regional Innovation, which is a new approach to innovation policy, but also that we implement right now in the form of a one-year pilot. And in my presentation, I will relate it to uh, smart specialization, but always keeping the focus on societal value and what we're trying to achieve through that. Okay. So let me begin my presentation by really highlighting the importance of innovation policy at this moment in time. As stated in the Fit for 55 strategy, uh, we are the last generation that can still act on time. So this is a really decisive moment to, to deliver on our commitments under the Paris Agreement and to really like implement policy, yes. innovation policy for sustainability, like environmental sustainability, economic, and also social uh, sustainability. So as I said, we're at the right moment in time. Uh, there's urgency to address the climate change right now, but we need to do it in a fair manner that really leaves no one behind. And as Katarina um, told in, our, in her presentation, that there are huge uh, regional differences in Europe that we need to take into account to transition in a fair manner. And this is also an opportunity to secure Europe's position in the economy of the future based on green growth and also like securing um, strategic autonomy. So right now is the right moment for a new uh, approach to development. Uh, we witness uh, global transformations in society, the way our food uh, sector works, um, transport sector and all kinds of systems. And um, here we have, a, with the European Green Deal, a return of industrial policy, but the Green Deal is more than that, it's also a social uh, policy in a way, and of course like a climate policy, but it, like, it is more uh, an integrated approach. And scholars um, like now uh, bring a new approach to uh, innovation policy, focusing really on system level innovation and transformative innovation policy. GRC is perfectly equipped to, to implement this new approach. Um, we're building uh, with partnerships for regional innovation on smart specialization. And uh, I'm gonna explain in a second how they relate to each other. So I'm gonna give you first um, a definition of partnerships for regional innovation. Uh, PRI is a new strategic approach to innovation-driven territorial transformation, linking EU priorities with national plans and place-based uh, opportunities and challenges. 
So the idea of PRI is really bringing EU level initiatives to the local level and to co-create together with territories. So how do we want to do that? Uh, through partnerships, um, partnerships between regions and across our levels of government, uh, but also wider with the private sector and uh, with uh, civil society. It is a participatory governance framework. Um, so really to involve different perspectives and shape it uh, together. And as I already said, it's a new way, it promotes new ways of working across government to really uh, break the silos in government and to integrate different approaches. So here you can also see that PRI really seeks to integrate uh, policy agendas from different uh, from different uh, fields. So from education, employment policy to social policy, industrial policy, uh, under a coherent logic uh, with this directionality focusing on sustainability. So here again, uh, a little bit uh, to explain better what PRI aims to do and is. So PRI really aims to um, enhance the coordination of regional, national, and EU innovation policies. Oftentimes they're fragmentation. Now PRI really tries to kind of integrate it better and streamline this approach to innovation policy. It is about identifying local challenges and set place-based directionalities for sustainability. So as Katarina said, that sometimes like at the local level, like the directionality gets lost and that is exactly the, the aim to focus also at the local level on the directionality at higher level. PRI um, aims to address fragmentation, uh, two different types of fragmentation, uh, fragmentation between funding and, uh, and policies and territories, so to align uh, the funding instruments and therefore to, in a way, uh, well, have a larger impact. And also the misalignment of regional, national and EU policy initiatives. So PRI builds on S3 uh, and is anchored in the EU policy framework and is really there to, to implement the European Green Deal and to also implement the new European innovation agenda. Um, PRI uh, is composed of three different building blocks, and I'm going to walk you through them. So first of all, the first building block is the strategic policy framework, which lays the foundation for action in the open discovery process and the policy and action mix. So here is actually in the strategic policy framework where broader and dynamic planning takes place, where kind of the regulatory aspects are being addressed, such as uh, mm -hmm. regulatory sandboxes, for example, to enable uh, innovation and experimentation. Then we have the open discovery process, and that is actually building on the entrepreneurial discovery process in S3, um, but tries to go like a little bit beyond that or be more inclusive in a sense of um, including a wider set of uh, stakeholders, also like a civil society, and really bringing in that, um, that directionality, uh, the focus on sustainability and to work backwards from, go uh, from goals um, to then the action. And last, the policy and action mix. This is really uh, related to the fragmentation aspect I just addressed, which aims in a way to, to uh, mobilize um, additional instruments to publicly, publicly funded projects. Um, so for example, private sector co-investments, but also uh, create synergies between the different funding instruments. So now in May uh, this year, um, together with the Committee of the Regions, uh, the GRC uh, announced the participants in the PRI uh, pilot. This is a one-year pilot that is right now taking place. We have 74 territories uh, who participate in total. These are four member states, seven cities, and 63 regions. And in the pilot, uh, we really want them to co-create, to work together, to exchange good practices, <laughs> and really learn from each other um, while revising uh, a playbook that I'm gonna introduce in a second. So the main objectives of this uh, one-year pilot is to uh, revise a PRI playbook um, for PRI design and implementation. So I have this uh, playbook with me. Um, this playbook uh, has uh, three chapters. Uh, the first and second chapter uh, introduce uh, PRI, this approach. 
And in the third chapter, uh, there are like uh, features, so practical tools, how these approaches can be implemented. And the goal is to revise it together with the uh, territories and to co-create it together and uh, really like adapt it also to the realities of the participating territories. Also, PRI aims to come up as a pilot with a new monitoring and evaluation approach in line with PRI and the sustainable development goals. PRI, uh, so this pilot, which seeks to implement the partnerships for regional innovation, wants to implement the new innovation agenda for Europe and build uh, capacity in the territories through knowledge exchange and learning. So here you can see the timeline of the events that have happened. Um, so in May, uh, the PRI pilot was launched along with the publication of this playbook. Uh, since then, we had several high-level pilot plenaries. Um, so for example, on resilience, SDGs, uh, regional innovation ballets. Uh, we just had uh, this week on Tuesday um, during the European Week of the Regions and Cities, also a presentation on PRI. And uh, more events are coming. So on the 26th of October, there is another pilot plenary on monitoring and evaluation. And um, in December on interregional cross-border collaboration. And then we're also launching by the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, the working groups. I'm going to explain in a second what it is. And I really want to encourage you to follow uh, these events. And if you want to participate, especially also in the open forums we have, they're really open to territories. We want to learn uh, from the experiences uh, of the territories and I'm really happy to, to have participants joining. Um, so how is our pilot organized? Uh, so we have an open forum. Uh, this open forum is open to the participants, but also other territories. Uh, this is really about uh, raising awareness of PRI to, to exchange uh, knowledge also with regions and territories who are not actively involved in the pilot. Then we have the pilot plenaries. Here, the pilot participants are uh, like the main actors and they're sharing uh, case examples of their territories. Um, so these are like closed events. I just said about um, that we will be uh, launching the working groups. Uh, so the working groups um, are also consisting of the territories and here the active work uh, is actually happening. So here they co-create uh, and uh, revise this playbook. So this is, and we also have uh, experts on the scientific committee. So, but this is how the pilot is organized. And now I'm coming to explain you uh, about what the PRI playbook is. So this playbook, uh, what I just showed, is really a document that uh, summarizes uh, and um, a theory and leading thinking and practice on innovation. This was co-created, uh, like um, um, created by by colleagues in the GRC, but also with territories together. And um, as I said, it is like structured in three chapters: uh, chapter one and two, explaining what PRI is, and in the last uh, chapter bringing together tools that how PRI can be implemented. Um, this book, and I really want to highlight it, is not prescriptive. It is like right now uh, created through uh, researchers at the GRC together with territories, but it needs to be adapted to the realities of the uh, regions. Um, so it has more impact and is more adapted. Um, so as I said, uh, you can find there uh, this toolbox and uh, which has 68 features with tools. So one feature is one tool um, explaining like um, showing tools for the different building blocks of PRI. So the strategic policy framework, uh, the open discovery process and uh, the uh, uh, policy uh, mix. And I want to talk today, especially about the second building block of PRI, the open discovery process, um, because I think it is so closely related to responsible research and innovation and really what we're actually trying to achieve. So the open discovery process builds on the entrepreneurial governance process uh, in S3, um, but tries to really bring in more directionality and involve a broader set of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So the open discovery process brings a new vision on the participatory governance approach established under S3 to meet the sustainability goals. 
Um, it aims to promote new works and uh, new ways of working across silos and working backwards from desired economic, societal, and environmental goals. So to really bring in this uh, directionality, um, it seeks to uh, for more engagement with stakeholders and also bring in this local mission approach. We don't have that yet in the pilot, um, but we're also pretty much looking to possibly incorporate that after this one year pilot. So here, for example, what you could find in this uh, playbook are the, these would be the tools um, for the open discovery process. So you can find fishes, for example, uh, on the um, like uh, on uh, the entrepreneurial discovery process and the relation to the open discovery process. You can find a fish on how to co-create for policy, how to bring in, for example, network intelligence, uh, like uh, like portrayed by the EIT. So these are kind of tools. Um, there is like a playbook to experiment with, but it is not prescriptive and is currently being revised with the territories. Um, yeah, so before coming more or less to the end of my presentation, I want to highlight that the PRI pilot participants are really core to this pilot that we're implementing. Uh, we really need to learn from their experience, from their realities, from their challenges and to co-create together this uh, play, uh, this pilot to uh, revise the playbook and to implement PRI. And this is perfectly captured um, by a quote by Mariana Mazzucato. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a professor at uh, University College of London and was heavily involved as well in shaping the EU's um, innovation policy. And what she says is that innovation policy uh, um, is really meant to actually co-create for public value. So she says, it is about shaping a different future to co-create markets and value, not just fixing markets or redistributing value. Um, it's about taking risks, not only de-risking, and it must not be about leveling the playing field, but about tilting it towards the kind of economy we want. And this is really underlying this PRI to bring in the directionality, to really, um, to 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 always focus on what we do on the broader societal well-being on what we want to achieve not just doing innovation but doing innovation for society and also with society so with this i'm actually coming uh to the end of my presentation um i'm gonna leave this slide for a second so you can uh scan the qr code to find the pri playbook and also to find news on pri um, I really encourage you, like you can come later to me and also check out this uh, playbook. Um, I think it's really great to take a look at it, uh, to see what it incorporates. There is also a, um, a separate document uh, that explains the concepts which underlie uh, PRI, which is very interesting. They're also related there to the uh, responsible research and innovation. And also you're really um, like welcome to take part in these open activities of PRI. If your territory is interested in taking part, feel free to also reach out uh, to the email address GRCPRI pilot uh, at EC Europa. Mm -hmm. EU. Um, the pilot is right now happening, but we always have opportunities to engage territories. And also, we're happy to see what happens after the PRI pilot, because this is a one year project, and we're right now in the process of also seeing what happens after that, how will it develop. So, yeah. Um, Feel free to contact uh, me or like send an email. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you have questions, uh, feel free to to raise them. Up. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, five. Sorry, five minutes for for questions. I think that's. Uh, I see that there are some questions also in the chat. No, no. no? Okay, question. sorry. So go ahead. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, for 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 your presentation again. Thank you for that. Um, well, it maybe this might be a dumb question. Um, if there are such things, but um, I'm I'm a bit maybe um confused about the relationship between the F four plus and the PRI, um, how they relate, is is this the thing that we are supposed to be talking about now, um, rather than 
S4 plus, what is the relationship? What's the history? History there. Thank you. I mean, um, like S4 plus brings also in this directionality, right? The focus on sustainability. Um, I must say, I mean, I came to the GRC in June, so I'm not yet there very long, so I cannot really tell you about the history between uh, S4 plus and, and yeah. You, you know, maybe, maybe I can give a little bit of I think this is a pilot. This is an action that spends, this is for uh, trying to do something and not to frame the, the policy discourse because S3 is uh, a little bit in the regulation. This is a legal obligation. But what we are trying to do is to run an action in order to inform the future S3 as, uh, as or future regional development policies linked to the city innovation. So this is something that you are not obliged to do. You are piloting, you are testing yeah. something new that can inform your S3. But okay. these are two separate things. Okay. This is how, how I understood it and from the discussions that yeah. we had in 2021. Uh, I know that this, uh, there is confusion uh, between S3, S4, or S3 plus, because there was a lot of uh, publications and discourse. But it is really about how and what we can, how we can bring the sustainability aspect and social challenges that were missing mm -hmm. in the previous program period. Uh, into the S3. So uh, this is an action. This is to test something, okay? And then we'll see how it can be incorporated. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think I'm the only one who gets these. No. Um, I can also like uh, just uh, still reply to that, that PRI is right now a pilot. So that's true that, uh, so it's not like something that territories have to do, like it's not like based on conditional funding or anything. This is a pilot right now, and we're trying to co-create this new approach to innovation policy, uh, partnerships for regional innovation, which in a way is really to, to bring in these three building blocks. So, uh, you know, so this is really right now being co-created together, and, uh, but it is, like right now happening. It's not yet prescriptive or anything, but it is like actively like trying to inco being incorporated throughout the pilot. Okay, thank you. So it, it's still okay to talk about S4 plus, or is that a term that should be correct? Yeah, but you can you can use this. I mean, like it's uh, the, the thing is that we need to get a common understanding of what is the requ legal requirement and what is testing and yeah. trying to do something that has specific impact for your territory. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, of course, you can call it, if everyone around you understand what you are referring to as a concept, then mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. But the problem here is that we are probably making sure of confusion. <laughs> you, you can, but... Yeah. So, so this will guide us, the results of this pilot will guide us towards S4 plus, perhaps, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, we will see that. So, I mean, the pilot is until like uh, June next year. And uh, so right now it's just starting to work in the working groups. And then, I mean, like we will like follow up on the impact as well of this pilot and really like then integrate it also in the, the larger framework. Yeah. Okay, I think that we have two, two questions. One over there and the other one here. No, I have a last uh, you have to, we have presented this about what is expected in the, in the, in the design of the PRI pilot. Uh, there have been three pilots so far, even though it's not been running in June next year. Are there any uh, elements that you can share out of these plenary meetings? Are there any conclusions already or some? If, if at least with the results of these plenaries are the same line, what it was expected, the expectations. I mean, it is not really like uh, like the plenary is about like uh, solving like a, a challenge or anything. I mean, this is really happening in the working groups. This this active uh, work. Um, what is happening in the plenaries is rather that we're talking about uh, certain uh, topics. So, for example, uh, um, here. So, for example, about resilient SDGs and the regional innovation valleys, and it is really about uh, where we invite regions to present their work on that. 
uh, so the, for them to share experiences with it. It's not really that there is like a, like a yes or no outcome or so. It is really about like sharing experiences uh, related to certain topics. Um, and then in the working groups, it is really to see whether these tools that we have, whether they can be implemented as such in practice um, or not, and what is needed for them to, to be able to, to deliver. So that is like a little bit um, like in like my re reply to that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Roberta Dalmaga, I'm the president of Uganda, so welcome. Mm -hmm. And I would like really to thank you, Anna. And I would also would like to thank you, Katerina, for your very interesting intervention. I just would like to put a, a, a comment, which is a little bit spicy or critical, not, of course, uh, in respect of what you said, but in general, in respect of the attitude of regions and nations when it comes to uh, plan when it comes to decide which is the strategy for the development of each nation or region. I believe that what you have said is uh, very important. That is uh, the, responsible, the responsibility in research and innovation and in general, the responsibility in policy making should be a must of each of our uh, policy makers and uh, technicians helping the policy making. Another aspect is the infrastructure in terms of multi-level governance and the capacity of the regions in uh, getting to the signature of a pact among the different actors in the territory. So this is uh, the question. And not only in order to have a, to put a nice dress to the whole process, because this is what we do usually, because we have to get the S3 approved, we have to get our plans approved, the operational plans approved, and that's what we do usually. And also we have to respect the different competences and uh, uh, not competences are only, but also uh, the territories of uh, the different councillor and administrators. So what shall we do in the future? Is it more important this question or the future of the population and citizens? So I'm sorry, it's a little bit political my intervention, but I think that all these very nice and interesting framework, all these tools in the end leads to that. So what we need really is to learn to have the tools in order, and this is a, a very good uh, test and experimentation to learn from each other how to manage this infrastructure of multi-level governance in order to get the most from citizens, from a, a non-governmental organization and uh, um, enterprises, businessmen and other people and citizens in general. So uh, what we need is methodology tools and also, uh, yes, how to come, how to get out from people their uh, their opinion on the different challenges and the challenges are there are there and they were there now we finally discover that we have these challenges so it's not my only comment thank maybe, you very much thank you maybe i can quickly still reply to that uh, i think what we're witnessing is just that all these projects are based on coalitions of the willing, right? We're having like highly motivated territories who want to drive change, but there are so many more territories which are not yet taking part and where it is also needed to implement these kind of changes. So I think what we're witnessing is just that right now we have front runners who are trying to, to really collaborate, who are trying to make a change. Um, and with them, it is important to see what works and then really bring these case examples uh, to other territories as well. So I think this is a first step, which then needs also to, to um, materialize other in other territories. Uh, just, just a very, very, very good question. Uh, there is a, some, some kind of uh, ambassador or local ambassador of the program in the regions, or is it just mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the relationship is between the commission and the regions? There is some kind of yeah. local intermediaries in the development of the program. So we're having like the representatives for each participating territories. Um, 
like who are like in a way like uh, the the middleman between like us and the regions. We have like also territories who are uh, like uh, joining as um, like as a broader set of territories. So for example, the Vanguard Initiative, uh, but we don't have like uh, people on the ground in local um, areas who are also taking part. But go to broad, but they're communicating through the. People. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, after this few very nice um, keynote speakers and speeches and contributions, uh, we are moving to the next section. So, we have organized uh, a panel uh, that will be moderated by. <laughs> well, so uh, that will be moderated by Mika. So I invite uh, to be, come here to Richard staff, please. Uh, also to Andy from Tampere, Jorge from uh, Cantabria, and I'm missing Raluca as well. So thank you for coming. <laughs> So it's this, yes, it is a the So good morning to everybody. I must say it's very nice to be here or the SCP with the curves and not the teams. So it's really great uh, to see all of you over here, uh, especially from the perspective of, of, of coordinating with different schools. Okay, so it's really nice I mean, to, to have you all over here in person. So welcome. So, but we have, as Claude said, we need to tell me we go to the session and discussion about. Okay, I was, I was Maybe it was a sign that it's shut up. I got one minute, yeah. <laughs> so we're out of type uh, schedule, but we go on to the session now. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, thank you for them as well, because we're really interested in trying to be point by things. So, while we're continuing the discussion, or actually, we are currently continuing the discussion on those issues in the right now. So, but we have, we have here, uh, we have with us four uh, experts, real experts of regional innovation. Uh, sustainably related issues uh, and, and small specialization of the year. And may I first ask uh, each of you to present shortly yourself, just one minute without a time cap. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So uh, maybe somebody has to watch over there and say like one minute. <laughs> but we have, we have here a first uh, uh, short round, which starts Raul Petsi, most of Approximately, uh, thank you very much for the invite. That's the first point um, to the panel. Uh, I was director of Erin, uh, which is an equivalent network to um, URADA um, until 2018, looking at research and innovation within regions. Um, and in, in fact, I was very much involved in smart specialization. So thanks, Catherine, for the history, because I was on the smart specialization mural right from the beginning with famous people such as Barbe, Crow, Morgan, and so on. So I was very much involved in the development of smart specialization. I'll come back to that later in the questions. I was also actually for the RRI, I was also in the last program period, a member of the group of science with and for society, um, which did look at RRI in the past. 
And just to say also one thing that I did when I was very pleased about it was the rapporteur for the European Capital of Innovation Award. So the ICIP ICAP, which is still going. So that's um, a very big thing. And the last thing I would like to say is that since being retired, so I am now so I say consultant, but basically retired, is to, to be very much involved in this uh, an organization called Friends of Smart Specialization with my colleagues Dimitri Kopakis and Jan Ross, and we're still keeping the keeping the handle going. Thank you, Richard. And how can you do it for all of us? So, Raul, please. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to meet again uh, people that uh, well, we haven't met for many years already. Uh, I'm Raluca Chubuzak, I'm representing my own company, uh, Louise Vino. Um, I have been working with my company since last year, at the end of March, and we are focused on process consulting for innovation management. And we understand innovation management in a, a larger uh, approach. So meaning not only supporting private companies to bring their uh, radical innovation to the market, for example, but also public organizations who innovate uh, the way that they are uh, implementing public policy, for example, as we did with the smart percent, uh, with the smart city strategy of Indonesia recently. Uh, I have been working for 20 years in regional economic development going through the whole cycle and I was the first coordinator of the first regional innovation strategy in Romania. Uh, I have seen the good and the bad. I have seen how frustrating it is to see that the uh, strategies are not getting implemented. And um, we are also proposing something in the field of social innovation. It's called first movers in partnership. It's, it's actually a process for management that we, we shall be soon providing to um uh, to stakeholders throughout europe thank you thank you Robert. yes good morning everyone and thank you Mika, for inviting me here i'm Anke Lippo, uh, a come from Bamba, a city region it's an, uh, a city region about two hours north of helsinki we have eight towns eight municipalities forming the city region and the population is with over four hundred thousand um, I work as a development manager for Foresight and uh, Sustainable Transition. Um, um, our organization is a municipal joint authority. We focus on land use planning, uh, transportation system, and uh, housing and, and, and public services. So I'm kind of an outsider in this smart specialization field, but um, I, at least you can call me a friend of smart specialization. Uh, I think our organization's aim is to create a borderless region. This means that citizens, if they live in one town, they can actually put their kids to their kindergarten in, in other other town. Or if there's a business investment coming uh, to the regions, we would think in borderless way and, and try to understand that investment in the region is actually creating value to all, all the uh, towns and municipalities. Um, so foresight and uh, sustainable transitions are my um, my things, and in the foresight side, we try to create a shared view of the operational environment we are facing. Uh, what kind of uh, trends and weak signals we can identify aside from mega trends, and basically trying to understand what is out there, what could occur, and, and also develop alternative scenarios for our support our strategic planning. And briefly about the sustainability side. Uh, we have a regional carbon neutrality um, uh, roadmap. Uh, we are currently working on a regional circular economy program, and we are also planning for climate resilience, uh, climate adaptation measures for the regions. But perhaps I can uh, go into the details a bit later. Yes, thank you, Anki. I understand that you are very much involved in small development regions. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, but it knows that it's money about. And first of all, thank you for the invitation. Here with you. My name is Jorge Muyo. I work for the regional government of Cantabria. And it's a region in the north of Spain, one of the 17 regions that are part of the Spanish territory. And we are a small region, but with a lot of experiences and all the activities about smart specialization. And my unit in the in the regional ministries of the smart transition strategy and one of my 
futuros, a lo menos más gases, en la evolución de la región. Hay que ver esto, para desarrollar el ecosistema, para evaluar, para coordinar con las smartest utilizaciones de la región. Hemos tenido la última smartest utilización, hemos estado involucrados en la próxima. A smart specialization and the idea is to share with all of you my experience about closing one aspect and starting again the other or the next smart specialization strategy and together with Soderkan that is the regional development agency that is part of the of the Tetris project we are trying to, to develop more actions more activities in relation with the responsible research and innovation we are part together in a in a pilot of the European Commission that is if you want I can share some of the of the feelings and of the of the tools that we have developed for industrial transition in regions. And I think that all of that mix and my internal view in, in, a, in a small region in, in, in Europe can help the, the group and and our and our audience to, to know better what we want to achieve with the smart specialization. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, as you can hear, we have a very nice uh, uh, panel over here, different experts uh, and, and approaching smart specialists so from different uh, perspectives, actually. From this starting point, I actually first would like to hear your reactions to our keynotes shortly. Uh, how do you see from your starting points, uh, on, on the basis of your own experience, that how do you see this? Uh, this kind of uh, initiatives, I would say. That, that, how do you see that? Uh, who would like to start? Two minutes maximum. I'm very strict on this. Two minutes, please. Uh, would I say it, it's not always which of the start, so maybe that would be the start. Uh, so the, the question, just to be clear, the question is about so the. How, how do you see from your uh, experience, uh, on the basis of your experience, the, the initiatives to put forward in, in, uh, in keynotes? Right. Um, yeah, so I, I, I noted down uh, two points that uh, I would like to, to uh, share with you in a sense of, um, let's say, problem solving. And um the first keynote uh thank you very much uh it, it was uh referring at some point uh, about the way that uh, the quadruple helix uh, was enforced and actually it was um educated let's say by by the the recommendations from smart specialization strategies um particularly in central and eastern europe where uh, the, the exercise and the practice of uh, building up formal partnerships was somehow lost uh, in time and we needed to recuperate. So I'm, I'm coming from that area and indeed uh, we had to struggle a lot to recuperate this partnership um, culture, let's say. Um, and um, what, what happened was that um, uh, in some cases, uh, these partnerships uh, went along very well and you, you saw uh, we saw that there was a lot of impact and that people uh, actually worked together and we saw results. But on the other hand, people uh, were also tended to hang on uh, a lot to, to the shape uh, that they need to fill in. So they, need, they, they felt like they needed to comply uh, this being a new um, a concept that they needed to comply to. So we also uh, saw that many of these uh, uh, partnerships that were built under a certain policy umbrella uh, were uh, not aligned, were not aligned. And uh, this is something that uh, we need to uh, be very much aware of uh, as well in the RPI uh, exercise. And I, I know that this is, uh, it is learning in progress and updating all the time. But I would first uh, point out uh, this, this aspect. Then secondly, um, I would like to um, um, stir the reflection a little bit around how policy making meets uh, innovation management. Because uh, uh, the, the, you spoke from the GRC uh, uh, angle about uh, innovation, innov bringing innovation into policy making. And indeed, it's like if we consider that uh, public uh, um, authorities, sorry, 
you're running on this side. Public authorities uh, should like uh, perhaps consider that we act like a company together. So, uh, and, and to have this in mind that you have the town as a company, you have a region as a company that is embarking on an innovation management journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a sign for less time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should try. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. 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 Maybe I should use this one. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More, more now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And I'll try to be free. But um, there's two notions I, I made and I would like to share with you. Uh, first, with Katerina's uh, presentation, there was the notion of uh, experimenting. And this is something that I, I also, uh, and we at our region, we emphasize, and uh, we feel that uh, uh, we do a lot of strategic planning and policy planning, but we actually, we can't strategize everything. We actually need to test in the real environment and, and carry out experiments. They can be larger scale or smaller scale, but uh, experiments should be applied into the uh, development. Another notion is that uh, Hannah mentioned this, uh, that uh, this PRI is also like tackling the return of this industrial policy. And, and uh, it's like weak signal we start to see in our region is that uh, if 10 years ago, uh, the smart specialization or the business development was focused on the hypothesis that we need uh, good uh, offices in downtown and uh, like the smart growth comes from white collar uh, jobs. But we start to see that actually, uh, maybe because the uh, due to the electrification of society and electrification of transportation, a lot of industry is actually coming back to Europe, back to Finland, and now we are uh, facing new challenges with how how we actually can accommodate these companies and, and, and industries with industrial plots, which we not have taken into account in our land use planning. So this was like a, uh, a scenario that we didn't take into account some years back. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can fully agree with, with my colleagues that we are we are facing right now. I think that's one one important challenge that is the industry and innovation is being more social, and we can see the impact that the, the industry, and for example, one one raw material of that, that industry that is energy right now for Europe, the challenge of of the energy, especially during the next winter and probably in the coming months, is getting in relation with, with all social aspects. So the industry needs energy, but uh, our homes and our life needs energy. So we are facing new challenges in relation with how to develop or how to, to, to think about new activities in industrial and innovation areas because they are becoming more social. And I think that the policy managers in the, in the regions, and we are facing three aspects that I think. The first one is the consultation process that we have to develop. I think that we, we need to, to be closer to the society, and it's hard to be closer to the society, and especially from the, from the perspective of the social services and from the perspective of the, of the public administration, it's hard to, to reach the, the ground and the, and the people. The second thing or the second challenge that we have is the participation. We have to be sure that the, the things that we are doing and the, and the movements that we are doing are in the, in the right mm -hmm. uh, path in order to, to be sure that the participation is the right one, that we need the, the perfect stakeholders to participate. And the third one, and it's more, even more difficult, is that at the side of the policymaker, we have to transform all the information that we are from the from the bottom to the to the up. And that's really hard because sometimes we don't have the enough resources in our own regional governments mm -hmm. to develop all those tasks. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's more a reflection rather than than an advice. If I had all the answers to this, mm -hmm. my my job would be easier. But I want to share it with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think more of this, not having hands on territorial like our colleagues here. I would say more sort of policy thing. First of all, thanks for very two very good presentations. The first one I would like to say on the Katarina 
was, of course, why S3 was because it was countering the whole lot of fragmentation of the RBF, you know, that money was wasted. I mean, I know regions not far from here where they got money, you know, a lot of money for the RBF, it's just totally wasted. So smart crystallization was the reaction again, the sort of certainly after the financial crisis, people remember stagnation, and also the East-West divide. So the, the issue was quite important to have some form of, in a way, top-down policy process, which would help all regions to improve their economy. That was the reality. Um, and I think Katarina said, well, the S3, but now the S3 framework should be revisited and extended to foster transformative system systemic innovation. So we all know now that we're in a transformation of I think we all agree that we're moving. And then, so that moves us in a way to the PRI. And so my intervention, Hannah, that the PRI builds on the S3. And then we have a very good question, what is PRI and what is S4? You know, I mean, what's the difference and what are they? I mean, the definitions. So a lot of question I have is, does PRI, is it in synergy with S3? Three or S4, or would it replace it? Um, and one, that's one point. The second point is this engagement with stakeholders. And I think the author has made that point. The more you widen into this ODP, which was the rather than the EDP, you get you've got more stakeholders, more conflict actually. Mm -hmm. And it, it, how long does this take? And who decides the final? Who is is it the government who says, well, you have to do this? Or is it a bottom up person? And how do you get the balance between the top down and the bottom up? And I think this is a big question on governance. And then, but it was coming back to our RRI, I think this is very interesting that PRI equals RRI. So there is a new possibility that they are, which was missing, to be honest. I don't think it really came in as much as the S3 at all. I don't think anybody was interested. And the last one I want to make is. Will the PRI link into the new European Bauhaus? Yes. <laughs> Question. So is this a, a, a sort of a secret introduction of linking smart specialization, PRI, and new European Bauhaus? That's one. Very interesting question, your last question, but maybe I have to yeah, have okay. respond. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, we, I would like to go further a little bit. You don't mind. I, I just feel like actually you already a little bit um, answered or responded to my, my third question, which I did that what kind of challenges there are you already crossed up on them. So I pass by it a little bit. And actually, I was thinking about when I was listening to the keynotes and when I was listening to you, actually to make sure each you a challenge over there in implementing these policies or integrating them. We have this multi-level governance problem over here, which is a kind of theoretical policy implementation problem. We have a European level over here. We have a national level over here. Then we have to reach all. And then, there is also also the horizontal, not only vertical. We have different policies, which have different aims, which are not necessarily uh, in accordance, so to speak, with sustainability targets or regional aspects. So how to manage this? I mean, this this is the real challenge, and how to implement, how to get the sustainability in there. Yeah, but I know. Now, now this is a huge question. So, sorry, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I allow two minutes because it's a huge. <laughs> and uh, who would like to start? I can try. I can try. Uh, uh, for for us, it's all about setting uh, common and, and shared goal, shared objectives, uh, uh, shared agenda. And uh, of course, this requires then the, uh, of the policies done on different levels in different verticals, they are coherent. Mm -hmm. So we need to create a solid package, but I would also like to emphasize communication. And for me, my main uh, stakeholders are the, are the mayors and, and, and these um, top decision makers in different municipalities. And 
I and we need to be really clear about our communication and what are our targets related to sustainability or, or circular economy. And if I would use PRI, S3, and these kind of um, acronyms, nothing, nothing would happen. So I, I would like to emphasize that clear narratives, change narratives towards sustainability, which is uh, known and shared between all the all the actors on board. Um, that's a, that's a start. Where you could could answer could you answer from the yes like the thing that we have such a, a, a global ecosystem in the region that it's hard to be to reach uh, each of the stakeholders with each of the knowledge or what enough knowledge in order to to receive the the, the good information so it's like to start seeding a lot of things and trying to 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 pick up the 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 right the right answers or the right information. And at the regional level, for example, we try to to develop uh, meetings in in some aspects of the entrepreneurial discovery process. So we try to develop sessions and meetings with with relevant stakeholders to 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 offer them the possibility to 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 give um, feedback from the challenges that we are trying to to, to solve or that we are trying to, to participate so we try to receive feedback from the from the from the bottom mm -hmm. and the and another hard uh, tool or, or another hard part of this of these processes to when when you have all the information in your in your office or with your team to try to to put it on the actions mm -hmm. so to, to translate all the whole information into strategic lines, into actions, into new ways of doing uh, the smart specialization processes or the innovation policies uh, uh, at regional level. And that's really helpful because we are, most of us, in, or at least at regional mm -hmm. level, in my position, for example, we are a short term periods for years that are the period that we have for the elections, and we have to think strategically what we want to do or what are the resources that we have in our budgets and we have to be very keen in order to, to reach those goals so, mm -hmm. so it's not an easy answer oh sorry, sorry an easy question and yeah. you have a lot of answers I, I know but it's really nice to hear all these answers from you that makes it real yeah what is it real in reality yes answer. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to come uh, at the moment just so that we can get to the last word? <laughs> no, I, I don't have much more to add, but I think the question of governance is always going to be key. You know, it's easy to wrap this thing down, but how do you do it on the ground? And also, how do you do it with a mix? I think it's sort of what you might call an administration process and a political process. And I think this is a particular idea of directionality of where we're going. This, and what we're seeing, unfortunately, in many countries now, and it's polarization, uh, you know, and the problems you have, you think you're going in one direction, and suddenly you have to go in another because the mayor is, has a problem with energy. And we, you know, obviously, you can imagine if you're in a region, it depends on gas, as we saw, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are difficult decisions to make. So I think it's not. It's not quite so easy as we think. The other point I'd like to make is that, as uh, Katarina made, is that the smart specialization is often bottom up and inward looking. And that was perhaps one of the critiques. And it, it, it is also a need to look outside your region mm -hmm. and work particularly across, as, as I know you do, in sort of North Spain and cross border work. And that, that, that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. The last word. It's like carrying the Sisyphus, the stone, you know, the <laughs> climbing. Um, well, uh, it, it's a very sensitive matter because it has to do a lot with listening, with listening rather than coming to, to judging something really fast. I, I would put four things on the table. First of all, that we need to disrupt the linear way that we do development. And we have we are used to this. We do this A, B, C, D. It's no time for that, and we need to accelerate. We know how to accelerate, but we need to restate another way to do. Secondly, um, professionals, networks of professionals instead of uh, hierarchies within organizations, and the professional to professional rather than organization to organization. 
Uh, thirdly, uh, methods and tools are amazing, and we have so many of them that are supporting us to structure our thoughts and our intervention logic. Uh, but there is process, which is overarching and containing all the methods. And the process means channeling what we already know. And the fourth thing I would say, the result oriented, the destination. We all know the destination that we want to arrive. If you bring, if we bring, if I go back to Timisoara and I uh, we invite, let's say, fifty people in 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 a room for the from the political politics, and we ask them, okay, how do you see your city in five years in terms of the green industries? And we come together and we start from that. We have a, a notion of the destination. We see that destination, and we start from there. But I mean. People know what they have to do. We know what we have to do. Mm -hmm. I guess it's more simple than we expect, but we are used to taking it uh, very much into structures and boxes. Of, and But we can do, do it differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that is a very good point, actually, that the mindset or attitude might be there, but, but then there are constraints which are structural in some way. Very good point. Maybe we have still have a couple of minutes. If you would have, uh, if the audience would have one or two questions, one short question, at least I'm looking at the clock. Sorry. Any questions at this point? If not, uh, please. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Me again. Um, not, not a question, but a comment. Oh, really? Um, I'm, I'm really thankful for, for Richard for drawing the drawing the connection between the PRI and for uh, plus um, whatever it, it may be um, and the new European Bauhaus. Um, I think that's exactly what it is all about, and we we should should be making these drawing these connections to to better understand. Also, another initiative that has come up throughout this week. Um, during the European Cities and Regions Week, is this living in the EU, EU um, digital transformation um, initiative? That's I view it. I'm not sure whether this is correct again, and sort of like the what New European Bauhaus is to Green Deal, this would be for the digital European Digital Compass. Um, so, and I think again, then further uh, drawing connections to PRI. Um, I mean, this is. This is all connected, so that, that was a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are we now? Um, are we here? Five minutes. Okay, in that case, I will teach you a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, very much you go about, especially you go about uh, the, the significance and importance of integrating citizens and different interest groups, uh, stakeholders in this process as well. Uh, and uh, I agree, mm -hmm. I fully agree. And, and, but, but it's really, really difficult process as you emphasized as well. So, but might it be also so that, that when we are talking about this, the sustainability issues and how they, the people see policy making, they're a little bit alienated about that, from the policy making as well. So, how could we get people involved and really kind of get involved in this, uh, these discussions, in this process as well? Get some involvement. And I think I think this is just one of the major mm -hmm. questions as well. How to, how to engage citizens, how to engage people in these processes? I know there are no Mm -hmm. uh, definite answer to this question, but, but maybe you would like to reflect a little bit or elaborate this question. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Yes. Well, I agree with what Carl Garuta was saying, and I think that the, the rules are there, so we have a lot of options to reach the, the social or the, the bottom of what. All the areas of the society in our reach. For example, I have all the opportunities and I have all the, the methods, the, the methodology. I can contact with experts in order to help me to, to reach the, the, the social aspects. I think that the, the hard part of the of this of this work is how to receive the right uh, messages and the right uh, tools or the, the right actions 
in order to, to put them into onto the action. And I think or maybe we can see some some aspects right now in our society with the, with the things happening around the energy. All the people is involved about the energy, all the people want to save energy in their homes, in their industries. Of course, there is a, a, a need at the European level. And for example, at national level, we have a, we need to do some plans at all the regions in Spain, compulsory plans, in order to save to save. Six percent of our energy. So we have to develop all those plans, and to develop those plans, we have been listening to society how they can save energy. What are the the, the pros and the cons that are going to 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 assume in order to save energy? We have been in contact with the industry. So with those with that example, with that example that is happening right now, we can see that. We can reach the society in order to to help us to solve the problem that is the problem in the lack of energy or the lack of resources in order to obtain energy in the communities. I think that that aspect can be uh, available for all the, the things that we have, for example, in the smart specialization strategies in our territories. So it's important to to have one one goal that is in this case to save energy and to open all the discussions and finally to have a report and a strategic report in order to see to say okay we are right here and we want to to reach this point and we are doing all these uh, points in order to reach yeah i think that uh, smart and sustainable growth and smart and sustainable uh, Specialization offers new forms of participation and new forms of taking action for the for the residents, for third and fourth sector uh, actors. And I also feel that in in many cases, these third or fourth fourth sector actors they actually share the same goals with the with the public governance. Uh, talking about urban culture, community building, social innovations, uh, uh, bringing bringing like creativity into the urban space. And, and so on. It's just a matter of uh, the public sector to offer um, like these uh, playgrounds or, or physical spots and places where where uh, the civic society can can do experiments, can create something on, on their own. And uh, I also think that uh, like different participation methods that we use, whether it be uh, citizen surveys or online dialogues with between the citizens and, and, and the, um, planners from the public sector these methods are also uh, uh, a tool for us to collect weak signals it's actually a tool for us to get better understanding what kind of trends are emerging on the on the grassroots level and and when you feed this information to the, the planning processes i think we are we actually can make better and more robust plans and and um, take into account the, what's really going on on the, on the grassroots level. And uh, in the end, uh, the, the collaboration between um, public and the, the civic society, I think it leads to a better quality of life of the cities and, and the livability in, increases. Mm -hmm. So actually, the, it, it, has, it has been already a lot said by my and Andy, and um, um, I would I would only add the fact that um, well, of course, social innovation seems that it's it's a, it's a, a recurring theme for today, definitely from many speakers, uh, which which is great. Um, and talking about reaching outreach and reaching to the citizens, I would uh, uh, just say two things so to add to what has been already uh, mentioned. Uh, first is to uh, understand the, the, the segmentation, understand the profile of, of the citizens, so which are the big segments mm -hmm. within uh, the, the society that we want to address, and then uh, uh, 
considering the profiles how we can best address because some of them you uh, reach through online consultations others you need to reach throughout the uh, organization that they go at for mm -hmm. example even financial administration you have to go there in person sometimes and then there can be a feedback mechanism or a survey over there mm -hmm. or in universities or in other places and the other way around is uh, also um, getting from the, the uh, from the direction, direction of the public authorities to see what is happening on the ground because there are many communities that are solving already problems in small groups, neighborhoods that are already uh, by themselves in silence without being promoted or seen <coughs> solving uh, problems, and that could be shown shown to be communicated. Thank you. Richard, the last word. Yeah, the last word is a citizen. Um, <laughs> I've tried to speak, yeah, I've tried to organize something in two years' time. So I have been in contact, trying to contact people. No phone numbers on the website. No, you have an info at the address, and nobody ever responds. And it's infuriating as a citizen, um, mm -hmm. you know, myself. So my advice is two points. One is to respond to people who have a name. Have a phone number that people can phone because a lot of people don't use not everybody uses email or you know snap whatever mm -hmm. and the other thing is to try and identify the multiplier citizen i would call myself a multiplier citizen mm -hmm. right so because i you know if you get contact with me i know other people and so you know and oh you can do this and do that and this i think is a way we should try and find who are those multipliers mm -hmm. and uh, that was my plan. Mm -hmm. Change agents completely mm -hmm. right yeah. as well. So, yeah, I think we have we are running out of time right now, and, and as well as we are not there. It's fine, but it's so good. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we need to stop this now. This session has this was really interesting. I would love we'll to continue this one hour more, mm -hmm. um, but maybe we have another opportunity to continue after this as well. But anyway, I thank you very much. But thank you very much that you came over here and this was really great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a happy break outside. Uh, so feel free to do some working, recovery, some energy. And uh, thank you again for our team. Thank you for those tweets. Yeah, no, it's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.